It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. For those of you who are familiar with the show, you know it's all about things going on at the University of Louisville and all the great stuff going on at U of L. For those of you who aren't familiar with the show, well, stick around for the next 30 minutes. You might learn something. All right, on the show today, U of L has one of the few federally funded alcohol research centers in the United States. We'll hear from the researchers who are looking at alcohol's impact on all parts of human health, both good and bad. But first, the University of Louisville is setting up an ethical leadership training academy in the College of Business, funded in part by U of L's athletic director Vince Tyre and Adidas. So, what is ethical leadership training and excellence, and how do U of L's athletics department, Louisville business leaders? and the College of Business fit together in this new venture. Virginia Denny and Ryan Quinn are both with the College of Business. Virginia is the new Assistant Dean for Corporate Executive Education, while Ryan's an Associate Professor in Management. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, let's talk about this new venture that the College of Business is setting out on in conjunction uh, with the Athletic Department. Um, I don't know. When it, Ryan, why don't you, it's your brainchild. Why don't you talk about it here? What is this thing? Okay, so we are launching a project uh, The ambition is that it will be a center someday, but the idea is that um, we want to create instructional tools and programs that will help people to uh, become excellent in ethical leadership. Um, And if I may, I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, A lot of times when people talk about ethics, they talk about compliance, right? So we have Mm -hmm. rules we need to follow. People are very familiar with that. Um, We want to focus instead on excellence, on moving beyond that. Um, So let me give a quick example. Uh, This is one I think everybody can relate to. I had some friends once a number of years ago who were working as a waiter and a waitress uh, in order to get through college. And um, they had a boss who routinely gave the best schedules each week to his favorite waiters and waitresses. And if you weren't one of the privileged, you know, uh, ones that he liked, then you might end up with a rotten schedule. Crappy hours. Yeah, exactly. You got the idea. So, um, you know, one week... The schedule came out, and then the boss had a family emergency and needed to trade schedules. And he came up to my friends and said, hey, will you trade schedules with me? And you can imagine what their (laughs) response was. Um, Now, I know what I would have told them. Exactly. (laughs) And in fact, almost everyone I tell that story to has the same response that my two friends did, which was like, no way. Look at the way you've treated me. What's interesting about that is if you and I stop and think about that for a moment, by making that decision, my friends and, and you and I and most of us who react that way are actually choosing to behave in the same way that they have been criticizing their boss for. Right. Right. Now, I don't think my friends were dishonest or lacked integrity in the sense that we usually talk about it. And yet that was hypocritical. Right. The pursuit of excellence involves going beyond rules and trying to say, how can I constantly get better at what I'm doing in terms of ethics? All right, you said this is a program that it, you want to start a center, but what what is it? What are we calling it? The institute? Is it's it a center? It's the program for, ex- uh, for ethical leadership excellence. And it's in the College of Business. Correct. And it's funded in part by who? So uh, it has been given $100,000 a year for 10 years from Adidas, $100,000 a year for 10 years from the athletic department, and one hundred thousand dollars of personal money, one time from Vince Tyree. Okay, and Virginia, let's pull you in here. Are these going to be classes? Is this a semester-long program? Is this something that um, you know, College of Business teachers and professors will be teaching folks out in the community that are business leaders? What What are we talking about here? Well, when you want to affect change, when you really want to transform the way people think, what happens in their their interactions and in organizations, whether it's within the university or external to it, you're talking about a variety of things. It's not just enough to go to a class and learn this. And we need tools, we need activities, we need a wide range of pieces that follow people through their careers and through their work lives. So this, this project is designed to create those pieces in some truly profound sort of ways that pull from different types of thinking and different, different uh, groups of people to, to create something bigger than us. We, we intend to change the world with this, not <laughs> but again, just... But again, who's it for? Is it for business leaders? Is it for U of L students? Uh, is it for folks in the athletic department that are employees? Who, who are we talking about? So Here's the have, target audience. We have this wonderful opportunity with the athletic department to begin to 
to build this together. The corporate arena is another audience. There are a variety of ways we can go with this. And of course, being at the University of Louisville, we want our students to benefit from it as well, and faculty. Right, again, we're talking with Virginia Denny and Ryan Quinn from the College of Business at UofL. We're talking about the ethical leadership excellence, which you may have heard about uh, because you heard perhaps about Vince Tyre and his donation, his personal donation, um, to help fund this programming. And athletics, uh, they fit in by just by the donation mm-hmm. and by the, the, the thing from Adidas. Um, but there's really two different segments here, aren't there? Isn't there something that's intended for the community and then something just driven by the athletics department? Or am I wrong here? Help me out. <laughs> You're doing great. Am I close? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> so basically, um, we have the purpose of the project is to create instructional tools and programs which will be delivered by others. So Virginia is launching an executive education program at the uni- at the University of Louisville College of Business and the executive audiences will be uh, re- will use the tools and programs and I and uh, curricula developed by the center for the executive audience. So that would be for like business leaders right. and others in, in Louisville right. who might want exactly. to come take some of these classes. Whereas okay. the college's departments and other existing uh, entities within the University of Louisville will receive, will deliver uh, the things that we develop th- to the students of the University of Louisville. And, um, <clears throat> and then we'll also, uh, as, as we uh, develop things, eventually start supporting research in the area as well. Talking with Virginia Denny and Ryan Quinn, who are both with the College of Business, and we're talking about this new ethical leadership excellence. Well, we can't call it a center yet. It's so a program. A program. All right. We'll call it a program that uh, they're working on. When's it going to start? When's it start? Well, we've already begun. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we have div- – uh, this gets to the other arm of what's being done with the athletic department that you asked about is um, in addition to helping us build the center, the athletic department wanted to be a part of changing things uh, at the University of Louisville and at the athletic department in particular. And so in, I think it was May or June, we had a uh, values creation day with many of the leaders at the athletic department to identify what are the guiding values of the department going to be. In August, we trained the top 18 leaders and uh, started making plans for rolling this out. And since then, we've continued to work with uh, both um, policy and program design, as well as uh, designing training programs at the athletic department, all to help uh, them in their transformation efforts there. So it started with there. We've also begun uh, developing some of the programs and tools. We've also um, begun reaching out to other potential students or clients as well. I know when Vince Tyree was on this program and he first announced that he wanted something in the athletic department because of you know all the NCAA infractions and those kinds of things that were going on. He wanted his top management staff to be trained in ethical, moral leadership. Um, and he, he mentioned that he was very interested in this. So since you started doing this training for the athletic department folks, what are you telling them? Are you just talking, you're not talking just about NCAA rules and how to abide by the NCAA rules. What you're talking about is what with the athletics folks? Well, so this is uh, that idea that um, excellence moves beyond rule compliance, right? And so when you take the values, for example, we've talked about um, we demand winning, but never at the expense of our integrity is one of the kind of uh, mantras that we've put together with uh, the athletic department. Well, so when we talk about that, what does that mean? What does that look like in your department? So we've done case studies, we've done activities, we've walked through this, trying to figure out, you know, when you get into this kind of situation, what would it mean to move beyond, you know, not just what, so they have a great compliance staff Mm -hmm. in the athletics department who teach them the rules and and, uh, help advise them when they come up with tricky situations. But if a person has the ambition to not just comply, but to be excellent in integrity and kindness and, you know, uh, all the different things that they're trying to do, then three things happen. First, compliance becomes a lot easier. (laughs) Second, you inspire the people around you to want to be better. And third, you change yourself. You change who you are and who you want to be. And Virginia, Denny, I'm, you, you were going to mention something there. Yeah. Well, you were going to chime in. But is, is something similar going to be happening with the business leaders in the executive education program you're putting together? Absolutely. And, and it, imagine for a minute what it's like when everyone is equipped to think that way. 
and and that dialogue becomes not under the surface but part of our everyday work and and how we work and think together and we we already have in 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 our relationships a number of corporations that we work with in that way in the Louisville area who are already committed to this. We, we, we live in a compassionate Louisville, right? We're working for that in the city. So in the inside organizations, when we bring these pieces in, it's very empowering. And the leadership begins to have tools that they can press out throughout the organization. And it not only brings about a better workplace and an ethical and, and virtuous workplace, but it also helps companies be more successful in the business arena and competition. It's a competitive advantage. So that's what we're working with as we move that out. And it's through training and consultation, events and conversations. That's, you know, on both the athletic side and the business side, a lot of folks might say, you know what, it's really tough when you're having to make a tough decision uh, about, you know, hiring a coach or, you know, you want to get a certain student athlete to show up on, on your campus and you're recruiting that person. That's really tough to, you know, abide by and, and set an ethical standard and say, you know what, you know, we just, we just got to do the right thing and not take this kid or not do this. Same thing in business. Mm-hmm. You know, I could make a million dollars over here, but I'm going to have to bend the rules a little bit. Um, it's the same kind of thing. So how do you, you know, how do you say, and how do you set that as a standard for both businesses and in athletics mm-hmm. when they're when you're trying to set those standards to be ethical? Do you want to take that? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to start it, Go and then you, you chime in. Um, I think it starts with a shared understanding of, of the ideal and where we want to go, but it's about opening up conversation, about uncovering these things that might be going on in just one person's mind so that they become more openly discussed. And there, there is a point at which you make a choice. But when you have that throughout the culture of the organization, it becomes a more supported process. So it's not done in a quiet corner. It's done openly. And that, that the other employees look to you as an example. Yes. And that keeps us all helping each other make the right choices. As far as like the right choices go, some right choices do involve trade-offs, right? And so you lose something to do what's right in this situation. Um, I have a... Yeah, remember, everybody does that. When you're a parent, mm-hmm. you do that. Right, exactly. <laughs> Every day. And so there will be some losses. However, those tend to be short-term, which is why on some level it's an act of faith to choose, you know, like the I'm right going thing to, to do, do this. But when you do that, you build up not just the culture, but also the reputation, the legitimacy. Um, you know, we can... I dissect different companies or athletic departments or other organizational organizations where what happens is as I build up this culture and this reputation, I actually attract people who want to be a part of that, who actually enhance my performance in the long run. Okay, Virginia, real quick, if uh, somebody out there in the business uh, world wants to contact you about taking these classes, uh, how do they go about doing it? And when, do, when, can they, when will they be available? They, uh, we actually can start anytime, and the um, the website is out there, and um, it's just a matter of setting up a meeting and talking through. Nothing we do is cookie cutter. It would be a matter of really, truly, what do you want to accomplish, and then making the plan to do that. And the name is Virginia Denny, D-E-N-N-Y, if you just want to search for it on UofL's webpage and contact you, I assume, if yes. folks are interested in Absolutely. learning some ethical leadership skills, right? Yes. Okay. Thank Very you. good. All right, Ryan, appreciate you being on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Good Thank luck you. working with the athletic department. The University of Louisville has one of the few federally funded alcohol research centers in the United States. Craig McLean is the head of that center, and Vasalia Vatsalia and Matt Cave are two of the UofL faculty who are doing work research related to alcohol, its impact on the liver and other organs as well as ways to stem that damage. Gentlemen, good to see you again, all of you. Great seeing you, Mark. All been on the show before. All right, well, let's talk about one study that uh, popped up here in the last uh, couple of months about um, the research you were doing on the on the liver and zinc right? Uh, and, and how all that works together with alcohol. So who wants to go first on that one? Mark, uh, Matt Salia? Yeah. Um, So basically what we found was uh, that uh, heavy drinking is associated with uh, zinc deficiency and that is uh, highly correlated in uh, alcohol use disorder patients who have uh, onset of liver injury. And, uh, so do you need zinc? I mean, uh, so I I drink too much and I don't, uh, I got a zinc deficiency, so what? 
those individuals who have uh, heavy drinking episodes, they might have more hypozincemia or low zinc than okay. uh, those who are moderately drinking. Yeah. But what's, what's the problem with so low uh, zinc, Matt? Yeah, so um, zinc is very critical for many of the mechanisms of alcoholic liver disease, and we think that this zinc deficiency occurs early, and it's actually maybe a cause of, of why some people get alcoholic liver disease. And so your question is, uh, you know, do you need zinc? Uh, if you give it, can you make it better or pre prevent the liver disease? Well, that's what we're working on through the Alcohol Research Center, and we've got some preliminary studies suggesting that you can can change the course of uh, alcoholic liver disease, which has no FDA-approved treatment, by the way. Right now, so you're mm -hmm. trying to figure that out. Correct. But zinc, so what, is, what does it do to your body, your bloodstream, or whatever that helps um, or hurts the, uh, the liver? So zinc is an essential trace metal, and so it's uh, something that's part of our diet. It's uh, found in protein, and um, so it is important for maintaining normal gut barrier function, and we've talked about that before mm -hmm. in its role in liver disease. It's important in re the repair process, wound healing. It's important in protein synthesis. So it does a bunch of things that are very important for the liver. And so when you're low in zinc, why the liver and the gut are more susceptible to alcohol-related injury. And that was Craig McLean, who's the director of the Alcohol Research Center at, at UFL. We're also talking with Matt Cave and Vatsaya Vatsaya, who also work with uh, Dr. McLean on the, on the alcohol research at UFL. Well, while we're talking to you, Craig, I guess uh, we ought to give an overview for folks uh, about the Alcohol Research Center. What do you guys do? So the Alcohol Research Center focuses on the global concept of nutrition and alcohol-related injury. And so that's one of the reasons we were looking at zinc. Uh, but, um, but we look at not only liver injury, we look at a bunch of other things uh, where alcohol can damage the organ system like brain dysfunction, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, heart disease with cardiomyopathy, pancreatitis, lung disease. So there are a host of different organs that we look at. And, um, but ours is the only center in the country that looks at the nutrition alcohol interaction. And that's where the zinc comes in. So, exactly. so Vatsalia, if I take a multivitamin every day uh, that has a lot of zinc in it, am, am I good? Even if I'm drinking a lot and uh, it, it may take that away? Um, there are specific doses that would help, but uh, having a multivitamin would not hurt. <laughs> <laughs> would not hurt. So take your multivitamins, ladies and gentlemen. That'll help you, especially if you're drinking too much, right? Is that the is that the message here, Matt? Is that do you take your multivitamin every day? Well, me, you may not drink too much, so. <laughs> Uh, I take one every day. <laughs> all right. Well, there you go. So do I. But I don't drink too much. Um, what are some of the other things you're looking at? I know, Matt, you've got some projects going on. We've talked to you in the past. Um, you've got some projects going on regarding alcohol and its impact on other organs and some other diseases. So what are you working on? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we are uh, recently completed a study that we're working on publishing right now, a clinical trial uh, using zinc, some of the knowledge that Vitsali and, and Dr. McLean and others have gained, you know, on the role of importance of zinc in the contribution to liver disease. So we asked the question, if you take someone that has alcoholic cirrhosis and give them zinc, in this case the dose was 220 milligrams of zinc sulfate, uh, can you improve some of these mechanisms that are impacted by zinc that uh, Dr. McLean talked about, and would that have an impact on the uh, severity of the liver disease? And so we enrolled a uh, small study enrolled 22 subjects. Some got placebo, some got uh, zinc. The ones that had uh, uh, received the zinc, their uh, liver disease improved slowly over several months. Uh, and we believe that the reason that it Im they improved was because the zinc uh, protected the gut barrier. So some of the bad toxins from the gut didn't leak into the liver and cause inflammation. and. Uh, uh, scarring in the liver, which is what the animal model showed too. So very consistent uh, findings with, with what we believe the mechanism would be. So you've got some early results that seem to show that uh, large doses of zinc can turn around or halt liver disease. Is that a fair assessment or not? Uh, that, that, that would be correct. 
Okay. And so is there anything else out there that you're, you're looking at to try and figure out, will this um, stop liver disease or stop the growth of liver disease from, from happening? Great question. So <laughs> Right in your wheelhouse, I guess, huh, Craig? <laughs> we, uh, we just got uh, good news from the NIH. So, as you know, we were involved in a big uh, network treating alcoholic liver disease, and that's just gotten refunded, and um, we're looking at new agents now. So there's going to be eight centers around the country, and we're one of them. And so one of the things that we're looking at is a – anti-inflammatory agent called anakindra that's an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist so they give that for what's that mean well it blocks inflammation so they give it for rheumatoid arthritis also inflammatory bowel disease okay. but uh, we're giving that and zinc together and so that's one arm the traditional arm is prednisone and then the third arm is a thing called gcsf and that stimulates uh, stem cells from the bone marrow to come out and go to the liver and improve liver regeneration. So it's going to be an exciting study. We're one of the few places in the country doing it, and hopefully we're going to start in uh, October. Why Kentucky? Why did they pick uh, the University of Louisville and the state of Kentucky to do these uh, studies? Well, we just told you that we're uh, the number one state for uh, increasing uh, death due to cirrhosis so um, um, we have a lot of people with liver disease and we have a very very strong group of uh, liver doctors here doing research including these two are they uh, right uh, now Absolutely. Vassalia do you do specifically uh, look at livers or what do you look at specifically uh, basically I look at uh, alcohol use disorder and uh, alcohol associated liver disease that would comprise early stage uh, liver disease and as well as alcoholic hepatitis. Hepatitis as well, okay, yes. and that's that's another one we'll talk about here in just a second. And Matt, specifically, do you work with liver uh, disease or what do you Yeah, that's, that's correct. So, you know, clinically I work at Jewish as a transplant hepatologist involved with patients before and after liver transplantation, but uh, in terms of unique research focus, and we've talked about this before, Mark, uh, my lab's been investigating the role of pollution and liver disease. So sometimes if you drink too much, you get liver disease. You eat too much, you can get liver disease. Or if you get polluted too much, maybe you get <laughs> liver disease. And these things, I think, can all interact with each other. Is that where the term, uh, when you drink too much, you've been polluted? You know, the young kids, they say, oh, I'm polluted, man. Is that where that term comes from? Don't you don't know, think Mark, that's the same I don't thing? Know. Uh, it doesn't I don't have anything know. to do with it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, well, you talked to, uh, Craig, you just mentioned that we have one of the highest rates or the highest rate in Kentucky among uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Is it the highest or among the highest? It's uh, the one that's increasing the most. Okay. So on a percentage basis, we're going up the quickest. Why is that? Why are people in Kentucky getting cirrhosis of the liver at this increasing rate? Well, I, I think it's just what Matt was talking about. So uh, we have a very high rate of obesity, so the obesity-related liver disease, which is a huge problem. Uh, we do have alcohol as an issue, and we have environmental problems that aren't studied very much, but Matt's probably the leader in the country on that. And then you know about the outbreak of hepatitis C that we have in younger people, and uh, then the hepatitis A epidemic, and so Matt's treating all those patients at Jewish. Mm -hmm. And the, the hepatitis A outbreak, we've had a number of folks on this show talking about it and what the, what, how it's spreading and those kinds of things, but from an uh, impact on organs and on your body function, Matt, is it having a dramatic impact on the overall health and the long-term health of people, or is this just something they're getting here in Louisville, and it goes away in a few months, and they live happily ever after. Yeah. So, Mark, you know, I know you've had a lot of people uh, come and talk on your show about the hepatitis A out, uh, epidemic and outbreak, So, but I'm the guy that actually takes care of these patients in the mm -hmm. hospital when they get sick. So, um, uh, most patients recover, and I can tell you one thing I think we've done very well, a couple things we've done well. Uh, but one thing that's most important is we've got the largest hepatitis outbreak in the country right now. I think it's up close to, to 1,000 people. So Kathy Sanders with uh, state government, uh, we're involved with her, just had a fantastic viral hepatitis symposium in Lexington and brought uh, leader, leading epidemiologists for CDC to discuss this. So we've got a big problem. Most people recover. 
Uh, but, you know, we're not the only place that this has occurred. Um, but I can tell you, I think it's, you know, due to excellent care that we provide, our death rate is actually much lower than elsewhere in the nation. And I think that's, a, you know, an attestation to some of the great care that we've got because there's no reason to believe that the virus is any less virulent in other parts of the country. Again, we're talking with Matt Kay, Vatsalia, Vatsalia, and Craig McLean, all from the Alcohol Research Center at the University of Louisville. Well, let's talk a little bit about your hepatitis study. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about that and the one with uh, that you, you dealt with, or was that Vatsalia? Whoever, de- whoever did the study that uh, Craig passed along with me uh, regarding the hepatitis and alcohol. Uh, the uh, zinc study yeah well and and how and how that plays into it yes right so uh, the you're asking about the hepatitis study right or? there was uh craig said there uh, you sent me some information about the hepatitis study that there was some big study that you were working on or you just gotten a grant to oh, work oh, on the yeah, hepatitis yeah, yeah. study yeah, that's on you yeah so that that's the alcoholic hepatitis oh, study the old alcoholic I, hepatitis yeah, yeah. well i didn't know there yeah. was a difference between yeah. alcoholic hepatitis and... so so that was the one that i okay. mentioned where we have uh the gcsf right, the right. anakendra the three-prong study three that you're study on. and um and the great thing about that is and people that enroll in that study um, are going to get all those medicines for free. So the NIH pays for the medicines, and they're going to get great care because they're going to have hepatologists that are very familiar with their disease process. So uh, it's a um, great opportunity, we think. Now, I've got to ask this question of Matt and Vassalia because I've had Craig on the show before, and he has said that small amounts of alcohol may be good. You know, having a glass of wine every day is a good thing. So you, you two are the research. You're treating folks, Matt. Vassalia, you're doing the research. So uh, would, you, would you agree with your boss here that, uh, um, that drinking a little bit of alcohol every day is good? Just don't overwhelm yourself? I think, you know, drinking one drink a day um, – it would be bene- it has beneficial effects as well but if anything excessive would certainly hurt so don't drink too much not drink too much but moderate drinking is uh, okay and it That's won't good. hurt you it won't hurt your liver won't hurt your your <coughs> organs those kinds of things matt yeah <coughs> mark so there's actually it's still somewhat controversial but there are some data suggesting that a uh, glass of wine or one drink a day might even be good for your liver. It could be protective against NAFL. Now, I'm not recommending to my clinic patients with, with NAFL yet that they go out and have a drink a day, but if they do drink it, have a drink a day, I'm not necessarily telling them to stop. I think the big issue is, you know, when you talk about moderate drinking, so if you're going to allow uh, one drink a day, you, know, you can't have seven on Saturday night, it doesn't work, doesn't work that way, which I think is a problem for a lot <laughs> of people. You can't do the average per day? You can't do the average per day. <laughs> That's not a good idea. All right, well, what's the next big thing you guys are going to be looking at in terms of alcohol's impact on the body? Um, what's the next big study you'd like to do where perhaps we can plow some new ground? Well, one of the important things that we're looking at, and we've talked to you about this a little bit before, is looking at the interaction between the GI tract uh, and the liver. And so we're very into modifying gut bacteria in the GI tract uh, and what the bacteria make. And so the bacteria can make bad things that are bad for the liver, or you can not make enough good things. And so we're looking at probiotics, that's good bacteria, uh, we're looking at what the probiotics make. Mm-hmm. And so um, if, if I had to pick one of the exciting things that we're doing, I think it's uh, looking at that. And we're going to hopefully be working with some industries on town on making a liver drink that's good for you. Making a liver drink that's good right. for you? Like, like Brown Foreman or somebody like that? Picking one of the uh, uh, booze I, makers? I, I, I can't mention a name, but that would probably be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> a, a good bet. Well, they're the ones with all the money, right? right. Thanks for listening to U of L Today with Mark Hebert. Go Cards!